There we go. Uh, good morning. My name is Adam Stein, and I'll be your host this morning for the Redshift uh, webinar. And I think everybody is seeing our screen here. And what we're going to talk about today are the cost realities of secure voice over IP. There's many security issues, uh, fraud issues, and analytics issues having to deal with voice over IP. And a great topic uh, for everybody involved in uh, carrier networks. And joining me today is Amitabha Mukherjee, the CEO of Redshift Networks. And Amitabha is going to go through a brief presentation. Uh, we'll have the ability to ask questions at the end of today's session. So please feel free to queue up any questions you have. You can communicate those via chat. And uh, we've got a couple questions that people have written in with as well. But with that, uh, Amitabha, you've got a, a slide share there that I believe everybody can see, and I'll hand it off to you to start today's webinar. Okay, great there. Thanks so much, Adam, and a uh, pleasure to meet everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining the webinar. Um, wanted to uh, appreciate your time, and we're going to talk a little bit as we talked, as it meant, Adam mentioned about the realities of cost of securing VoIP. And um, basically, this is a very important topic because, as we know, that a lot of folks are now moving towards uh, SIP base network with um, other applications that are WebRTC, et cetera. There's a whole issue around how do you secure this? What does that imply as far as um, requirements for security? So let me talk a little bit about that. Um, we'll have about a half an hour session here, and then I'll go into Q&A, and then we can start. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to come in. Um, so this is data based on a lot of the things that we're seeing um, in real world networks and um, in real carrier live networks. So um, this is very, very da um, real data that we're getting from actual attacks and actual networks. So a um, couple of first things. Um, so fraud is a big problem, as you know. Um, a lot of carriers have moved their network towards SIP or they are moving their networks towards SIP. So as they do that, um, fraud on the SIP side gets exasperated. Um, because they manipulate the SIP protocol or the IP piece of the, of the network to actually do fraud as opposed to the traditional TDM um, environment. So a lot of the traditional methods of CDRs are effective, but not totally effective in really looking for fraud attacks um, because you want to preempt these, and you can do that with that. Um, global robocalls is a big problem. As you know, the FCC is rolling out a whole um, regulatory framework towards carriers to start enabling um, state shake, shake and stir um, commit, um, requirements specifically to prevent robocalls. That is a big problem. It's about $9.5 billion problem. Um, bad network configuration issues around the network has always been an ongoing problem in carriers, um, about $15 billion of loss in that. A um, couple of you know, use cases that we have on real world losses. We had a carrier that was losing about $100,000 a weekend, every weekend. Um, for one call forwarding attack. So folks were forwarding calls um, to external destinations. And so they were losing a lot of calls there. Another carrier was sustained um, about $2.5 million of loss for TDOS attacks on the network, telephony DOS attacks on specific numbers on customers, et cetera. Um, a third carrier um, had about a million dollars of loss within an hour of folks that had hijacked their test user accounts their soft clients with test user accounts and generate about a million dollar fraud to high cost countries. Another carrier, again, um, they were using specific soft clients from their own network. And these guys had hijacked using IBM soft clients and again made a lot of calls and about a $6 million dollar loss there. So these are real world cases of security implications as you go to VoIP. Of course, you do need to go to SIP and you need to go to IP because um, you know the whole mold is moving towards that. Um, and you can offer many, many services with it. But along with that, just like an enterprise or just like a personal, um, once so if you buy a computer, you would put an antivirus and a um, soft, cl um, you know, soft client with um, McAfee or some silence or some of these um, security functions on a computer. We also want carriers to think about en enabling security for their SIP network and very strong and multi-layered security environments. And as I said, the... Um, Financial losses, again, FCC mandates, um, it's a huge problem. Um, the TDOS, the TDOS was really interesting. So what they did was um, they called up a couple of enterprises of this carrier customer, and they told the enterprise that if you don't give us um, you know, $30,000 within the hour um, to this account number, we will have a sustained TDOS account um, attack on your network. And this is a major call center, or it's their main number for this large 
um, global company. So you can imagine very, very rapid response they had to, and, and um, so they lost a lot of money there. Now there's all these SIP scanners that are out there in the dark web, and they're constantly scanning all the carrier networks, and they're looking for vulnerabilities. Um, they're looking for weakness in the network to then generate attacks. And um, we've had one carrier where um, they had about um, two, about a, a year of attacks all around two in the morning to three in the morning, and they were just scanning the network for a year, and then suddenly they did a sustained 126 minute um, attack. Uh, from 6,000 different IP addresses and pretty much brought down the entire care network because they had spent that year learning about the whole network um, based on the scans. And a lot of the unfortunate thing is a lot of the SPCs respond to a lot of these invite option scans from carriers. Um, they think that are friendly to them, but of course those carriers are just sending them data to their public IP address or invites to their public IP address, not knowing it's coming from an attacker or source. And again, um, you know, fraud is a big problem with revenue sharing fraud, subscription fraud, and IPPDX fraud, which is a $29 billion loss. Typically, carriers lose around 0.5% or 1% of their revenue in fraud. And of course, the IP segment, as I mentioned, is one that's getting exasperated. The SIP segment is where the more and more attacks are happening. Um, one interesting fact is you know, the cybersecurity world, as you know, is a very large um, industry. Um, we see up attacks every day from these networks all over the world. Um, and it's about a $220 billion market by 2021. There was about $2 trillion of loss of cyber attacks. Um, and it's a lot of loss for a lot of companies. Um, you know, we see attacks from state operators and mafias, from um, just hackers doing it, whatever they want to do. And um, what's interesting is that you know, the Enterprises have about 70 different categories for security. So they buy an antivirus, they buy an spam, they buy next generation firewalls, they buy machine learning tools, they buy encryption, they buy IBDS, IPS devices, they may have you know, systems that protect their um, core um, database centers, et cetera. So there are many, many different products for security. While carriers, if you look at the VoIP network, specifically the SIP network, typically only have an SPC maybe do some encryption and some authentication. So we have three categories of security while enterprises, large enterprises have 70 categories of security. So we just want to mention to the carriers that you know, there is these layers of security you have to implement as you have a 10, 20, 50, 100 million user population that's over SIP because now you have 10, 20, 30, 40 million endpoints that can be compromised and attack your network. Um, in an enterprise, it's, you know, thousand PCs, thousand phones, um, so 2,000 nodes or 10,000 nodes that can attack networks. So they have all these categories. So you can imagine when we talk about millions of endpoints and millions of systems, that problem gets exasperated. So we really encourage carriers to have what we call defense in depth. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what's interesting also about the cybersecurity area is that only 6% of the cybersecurity threats are detected globally. 95% are go undetected. That's a huge number. So as you can imagine, um, attacks get through the network continuously and it's always a catch up game. You're always trying to implement solutions to solve the problem, but you have to solve it because otherwise the implications can be pretty drastic for your network and um, the need for actionable analytics and you know, zero, um, near zero intelligence of network threats and attacks is so important to, be able to really block those attacks and you know, basically secure your network. Um, we see these attacks coming from all over the world. Um, I think there is a website you guys can go, go, go up to. So it's called voip-attacks.redshiftnowers.com. It just gives you a snapshot of um, some of our customers that are constantly getting attacked um, in the networks. Um, and these are botnets that are coming in from nodes in all over the world, whether they come from Russia, from um, Germany, from France, and or even the US. They're basically compromising hosting uh, servers or data centers. And from that, they will then attack these networks. So they look to come from you know, legitimate and, um, data centers, but they're not. They're just you know, putting their software on those nodes and then attacking these networks. And they constantly change. They'll change every five minutes. Um, but they're constantly attacking them. And so you need an environment where you can actually protect these. And we have this whole global SIP threat intelligence map that we'd like to show you, of course. Um, and of course, talking about that global SIP threat intelligence, you need sort of multiple things when you're connected to a network. Um, you need threat intelligence. You know, Redshift also has the Contra Labs signatures for vulnerabilities within endpoints and SPCs and PBXs, et cetera. 
um, we have a SOC team, we have a data science team, we have a cyber intelligence team that we're building out now. And we see about 5,000 attacks continuously on each node out there. Um, last year, we saw about 27 million SIP botnet attacks hitting these carrier customers. Um, the 30 plus carrier customers that work with 35 carrier customers. Um, so that's a huge number. So it's almost like a million per carrier. And um, you know, if you look at it during a month, so that's you're talking about 100,000 attacks per month, so which is a pretty aggressive number. And that's growing up aggressively. I think it tripled from the previous years. It's a very interesting number. Um, we protect against you know 40,000 different attacks. Um, there can be attacks where they manipulate the mailboxes. They can leave spam messages on your on your phone system. Um, there's attacks where they can hijack the call and route it to a fake IVR system, and then um, you know do some fraud there because they ask you for your PIN number and your account number um, if you think it's your bank you're talking to, and then they can steal that and do fraud. There's other attacks that are out there like they can use the conferencing function and do a call park on the call, a legitimate call between a customer and his financial institution. And then they can listen to the conversation and then you know, steal all the credit card information, whatever they're talking about, or even a CFO talking to his CEO or, or other people in, the, in, in a conference call. And they can lack, get into the network and then listen to all the conference calls. Fraud is a big problem, as I mentioned. Um, and then eavesdropping, they can do in RTP injection where they can actually can change the buy to a sell. Um, you know, suppose you're saying I want to buy 10 million shares and um, the attacker actually changed the buy to a sell and um, so you can change the trading or if CEO says I had a great quarter, comes out I had a bad quarter, the stock will tank by the time it recovers, they had a lot of problems. So there's a lot of these threats. Um, there's fuzzing attacks which are really malformed packets that are basically SIP is such a broad protocol, it has like 45 RFCs that it works with. And um, you know, the, the objective of SIP was that it can interoperate with all these different products and vendors out there. So because of that, it's the openness, which is really the richness of SIP, allows for attackers to be more aggressive and, and exploit those, those weaknesses. And so they can do malform packets, um, there's eavesdropping attacks, there is other attacks like interception and modification, um, there's weaknesses in, in device configurations, um, you know, mm -hmm. simple passwords, things like that. Um, there's, as I mentioned, telephony DOS attacks, there's vulnerabilities within the operating systems of phones of um, you know, PBXs and other devices, communication devices that you have, or soft switches, et cetera. Um, this is just the inherent you know, IP and TCP network infrastructure that you need to um, protect against their weaknesses there. There are a lot of vulnerabilities on the web protocols I mentioned, robocalls, uh, SIP botnet attacks that I mentioned, signal manipulation attacks, fraud attacks, Wanguri fraud, uh, international revenue sharing fraud, uh, media manipulation attacks, uh, spam or inter telephony. I talked a, lot, a little bit about that, where you can leave a voicemail messages, spams essentially for voicemail. Um, and then there's all of the infrastructure threats at voice, at different applications like IM, web, and collaboration, et cetera. There's application layer threats, there's data to voice threats. So in the SIP packet, you can inject SQL um, commands in there, so you can generate an SQL injection attack. And then there's all these voice phishing attacks. So there's multiple threat vectors out there that you have to be aware of, not just you know, encryption authentication solves it. Encryption authentication solves about maybe 30% of the attacks because you're protecting against man in the middle attacks, which is you know, in the middle and sometimes at the endpoints, but you're still um, susceptible to 70% of these other attacks. So that's one of the fallacies of encrypting, just encrypting and authenticating your network. You need to have multiple layers of defense. Enterprises, you know, many years ago, 20 years ago, found out that encryption authentication didn't really solve any problem. So they have multiple layers of defense in their network, which is very natural for them, just because the evolving threat problem becomes much more aggressive. Um, at Redshift, we have this um, vulnerable research. If you go to just condorlabs.com, um, you'll see um, we um, publish a lot of these vulnerabilities that are out there. Um, you know, there are fixes for that. We build signatures for them also, zero day vulnerabilities and everything from endpoints to SBCs to soft switches, et cetera. And we have a very rich environment for that. Um, today we have about 35 care deployments, um, about 17 active trials. Um, we saw about 27 attacks that I mentioned. Um, some of the impacts of the attacks were, there was um, about 16.6 .6 million on a call hijacking attack on 8.6 million on another IRSF fraud attack. Um, and then you know, we today have around maybe 50, close to 50 million users that are um, we are securing, and that number will double or even triple by the end of this year. 
Um, I talked a little bit about the categories of these attacks. And um, if you go through them, um, there are fuzzing categories, um, the eavesdropping ones I mentioned. So within those categories, there are multiple attack vectors that you can have. So I mentioned some of the tools like Protoss and Codemana Conspirant because they are tools that exploit some of these um, attack vectors, but they're more testing tools. But what happens is the attackers are using these attack tools to really attack and target the network to bring these network down. So that's the problem set. Um, and then there's eavesdropping attacks. Number harvesting is an interesting attack where they would go and find out the numbering plan for your enterprise customer. And then they will start then trying to guess the passwords for that. Um, and then after that, they'll start registering the network and making calls. So um, it's you know sort of a, a, a reconnaissance-based attack where they go from stage one to stage two to stage three as they're building out an understanding of what the network is. False caller ID attack is basically um, you know, you think it's the CEO, you think it's bank calling you, it's not, or you think it's the IRS calling, it's actually not. Um, fraud, robocalls, I mentioned TDOS, I mentioned, and the others. So these are a lot of the categories, some of the categories of these attacks. There are, as I mentioned, vulnerabilities in operating systems within the manufacturers themselves. There's hundreds and hundreds of scanning tools out there. So if you go to that corner labs environment, you can see these scanning tools. We just put a few up there because we didn't want to, of course, tell all the hackers, all the different scanning tools that are out there. But every month or every week, they're coming up with new scanning tools that can track these networks. And they just leave them and are readily available on the internet so they can download and, and attack these. Some are tools that are used for debugging, but they've manipulated those to generate attacks. Um, I talked a little bit about the unified communication threats of so voicemail threats, conference threats. Um, collaboration threats and others that are at the application layer and the ability for us is to actually not only detect it but also mitigate it so we can actually block these attacks at the SPC at the um, as switch, soft switch core or at the um, routers themselves so what we're talking really about is this whole concept of having a defense in depth approach to your network so just imagine a, um, a castle with a moat and the little village out there um, the king lives in his, his castle and not only has he has the little moat, he has the wall, but he also has you know, soldiers all over the place that are protecting before they can get up to the core, which is basically what we consider the soft switch structure, infrastructure or the IMS core. And a lot of carriers on the mobile side may have implemented just encryption authentication, but as I said, that's only solves about 30, 40% of the attack vectors, which are really the man middle attacks and the authentication attacks that can generate at the device level. But you're open to all the other attacks. So not only the SPCs, are there the SPCs will be considered to be doing what we call layer three and layer four attacks. Um, they're you know, more in the network side, TDOS attacks and others, but you need a threat, a higher layer of intelligence to be able to bifurcate those functions. A little bit like where traditionally many years back there was the routers and the and the firewalls. Um, but the routing vendors said, oh, we can do you know firewall functions within the router, um, but they can only do ACLs right, or access control list. But on the firewalls, um, they realized that, hey, you can do this whole rich other things that you can do, which because of the attacks are very so sophisticated, the routers just couldn't handle it. So it's basically by bifurcation of the SPC, and now you need a security device. So SPCs will do layer three, layer four, and then you would complement it with the product that does specifically layer three all the way up to layer seven attack vector analysis, et cetera. You need a carrier class IPS IDS device, you need an operations network operations center, a SOC for VoIP. You need a threat intelligence for VoIP. And of course, your fraud solutions, both proactive and reactive. So the CDR solutions are reactive. You need SIP-based um, you know, DPI, um, deep packet inspection systems um, that can be proactive in getting the fraud mitigated. And then, then you can secure your core. And the attacks are coming not only from your customers, residential users, but also from your And um, the, the VoIP um, attack vector, um, you know, they basically have multiple ways of attacking. So what they'll typically do is they'll use some tools out there to enumerate and discover your network at, this, at the initial level. So they'll send it to the soft switch, they'll send it to the SPCs, because a lot of the carriers, their entry points is the SPCs. And since these are public IP addresses, um, the SPC, you know, is becoming a well-known entity within the 
hacker network. So the hacker knows every single network facing SPC for AT&T, for Telefonica, for et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because you know, they're all sending these invite messages. They'll do a global scan from 1.1.1.1 to all the different IP addresses and see what comes back to them. And they've been doing these scans. I think you guys may have been aware of suspicious scans that have been doing for a couple of years now. So they've collected a huge set of very rich data of every single carrier of what's going on. The problem is, if the carriers are responding to these scans, they send a 403 because it's an unknown user or something. It just tells the attacker, hey, there's a VoIP element there. They don't respond to the scan, then they, you can hide your network. Then they start not knowing what the actual IP addresses are of the SPCs and the different points of the network. So that's one real big issue that carries me to do to really not respond to these bad actors. So understand who the bad actors are and understand, okay, these IP addresses are bad guys, we shouldn't respond to them. These are good guys, we should respond to them. So that's real threat intelligence you really need to do that. And then they use all these tools I mentioned. There's things like SIPNAS and SIP Bomber and, and Invite Flutter, et cetera. And then they would use fuzzing tools to bring down the network. And so it's, you know, it's a methodology to their madness, as they say, but very aggressive and interesting tools. And they're getting more and more sophisticated. They're getting more newer tools to attack the networks. And we've seen constantly new things happening. So that's where we come in to protect these networks. Um, you know, this was a typical example of a cyber attack timeline about three weeks. Uh, this is um, you know, sophisticated botnets that were hitting carriers. Um, on this particular carrier, we saw you know, different attacks happening in different time frames. So we took a snapshot from you know, about three weeks of data and we saw these are some of the different attacks that we're seeing from these botnet attackers, which is interesting. So they basically manipulate the, um, the attack vector. They use valid usernames and credentials. They use, you know, they try default passwords and then they start um, you know, changing the passwords so they can crack in. They use dialing plans. They use other, they look for other vulnerable nodes and privileged accesses to get into the network. And then from that, they generate the attacks, right? So this is a, 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 a lot of interesting activity that's going on in the, in the cyber world. Um, this is a rough diagram I just try to show is all these are attackers hitting these particular two nodes. So these XXXs are customers and these are SIP botnet attacks. So you can see they're very rich and some of these are attacking multiple carriers at the same time. So um, they're not only, you know, we see carry, um, these botnets attacking 20, 30 carriers at the same time. Um, so we know them to be really bad guys. Now, why would this you know, attacker be attacking you know, the five, 10 carriers at the same time? So we know these to be very malignant um, botnets, right? And so basically <coughs> what we talk about is, um, you, know, very, you have to have uh, different ways of approaching this problem set. One is stop responding to the SIP botnet attacks. I mean, your VoIP infrastructure is, is weak in that sense because it is responding. And that's the, you know, it's, it's unfortunately a very um, difficult thing because a lot of carriers, of course, will first focus on quality of service and make sure that the calls get through and, um, you know, making sure that our customers are satisfied when we enable an VoIP environments or IP-based or SIP-based environments. Um, but with that, you have to consider the implications of that environment and look at the security environment so you don't open yourself up to these attacks. And so A is stop, you know, stop sending 403s or 404s to all these botnet attackers, right? And then block them, you know, don't let them, you know, send you um, block them in the SSBC so they don't get into your network because some of them just walk right in and, and we've seen many carriers where they've gone up all the way up to the CSCF um, in the network, these botnet attacks, right? And then another thing, critical things to have multi layers of defense. I mean, you really look, should look at encryption. I mean, if you already have it, that's great. You should look at authentication. You should look at this, you know, voice cybersecurity firewall. Um, you do need this threat intelligence to tell you where these botnets are coming from so you can block them and on, on a real-time basis. You need to consider having a web sock. You already have a data sock probably. And, and of course, the interesting thing is a lot of the data folks don't understand SIP. Well, you understand SIP very well. So there needs to be a ramp up of understanding um, from the cyber side what SIP is and what the implications of SIP is. So that's a whole, um, you know, basically it's training of the staff to understand the voice network and security implications on voice. Um, and then you need the staff to research and handle these security incidents, just like you would in a data network. You know, your, your enterprise, your um, IT department has already a cybersecurity incident group. Why don't you have it for the voice group also? So basically that's the whole idea. And then of course, a lot of the frauds that I mentioned is generated from these SIP-based attacks. Um, 
I wanted to stop there and have a, you know, just a quick presentation on, on, on this topic. Um, we will have more of these um, specifically talking about botnets, more and more details about it and talking about how you can actually monetize and make revenue from some of these um, implementations of solutions like ours. Um, so it's not only a um, expenditure on your site, but you can enable it as an enabler for revenue also. We'll talk a little bit about that next time. Awesome. Thanks, Amitabha. So uh, I've come back off mute and a couple of people have asked questions so far. And uh, let me tell you what some of those questions are. And uh, feel free if you're listening to ask questions as well now uh, via the chat function. I've sent everybody a chat, so feel free to uh, respond back to me with a, a question that you may have. So the first question that we have is, how quickly can carriers deploy a unified communications threat management? Does it take weeks or months to be effective? Right, so um, basically the, um, the answer is pretty quickly. And that's because um, what we do is we don't um, actually it's, it's a tap in the network, so it's not a inline device where or a bump in the wire, as I say. So tap in the network, and we just tap the SPC traffic um, to our product, and then we can mitigate it. If you want to block these attacks, not only have a look at them, we can mitigate it by sending um, blocks into the SPC or to the soft switch infrastructure that you have. Um, the only, of course, requirement is that um, as you deploy the solution, um, you know, the rollout is if you have multiple data centers, you have multiple cities that you cover, multiple countries that you cover, that's the rollout that you have to do, right? So in, what we typically do is we just do a trial system with a carrier. Um, it's very fast to bring up a trial. We have a virtual version of an appliance version, so depending on what you're comfortable with. And um, all you do is just route the traffic to that product, and we can immediately show you these attacks. We can work with you uh, within a couple of days it'll be configured because we just need to understand how the dial plans are and network configurations are etc cetera, etc cetera, which are things that the system learns also so it's uh, learns to con auto configure and then um, we can we during that trial for 30 60 days we send you reports every week and show you all the different attacks and threats that are going on uh, so you can actually see these attacks live in your own network and unfortunately um, a lot of these attacks happen, and they're already happening in the network, and unfortunately, a lot, there's not much visibility about this, so that's what we bring. Um, so yeah, so the implementation is pretty rapid. It just depends on how big the network is and how, you know, what the extent of the number of systems and environments that needs to be implemented. Thanks. So actually, speaking of learning, the next question, is there a behavioral learning aspect to stopping anomalous SIP traffic? Yes, definitely. So um, there's multiple behavior analysis that we do. Um, you know, we have, um, basically we learn, if you sort of dissect the, the network layers, um, the OSI, a long, long time ago we talked about it in college, of course, um, you had the you know, layer three, layer four, layer five, layer six. So um, the user layer, which is the customers and the way they're making calls and all that, that we have behavior analysis to do that. So we basically understand um, what the behaviors are of every single user within the entire framework of the customers that you have. So if you have, you know, 10,000, 100,000, a million users, et cetera, through multiple nodes that are installed in different parts of the network. So every SBC pair would pair up with a UCTM or it could collapse to one UCTM or multiple UCTMs regionally. Um, that you will learn behaviors of every user. Um, we also learn um, through our analysis of the packet flows, et cetera, we learn all the what is the internal network, what is the external network. So we start understanding by ourselves um, through behavior analysis, you know, what is good network and what is bad network and what is good traffic and what is bad traffic, what is um, normal traffic and what is anomalous traffic. And we use the word anomalous pretty generously. Anomalous means not normal traffic. So an attack can be not normal. A 46 um, can be not normal because it may be a DDoS attack or the network may be just busy. Um, and a 403, could be not normal because it could be truly someone got the credential wrong or they didn't have the right phone number, sorry. Or it could be someone just trying to ping it and trying to get the right phone number and could be an attack. So that's what we consider to be anomalous activity. Hmm. Okay, interesting. So speaking of attacks, at the beginning of today's presentation, this question uh, brings up the fact that you talked about escalation of costly attacks mirroring those that are occurring in the data world. Are they happening at a more rapid time frame and more costly? And if so, why? Right. Um, and it's sort of the good question. So basically, it just goes back to the history of cybersecurity. Um, if you look at cybersecurity and sort of the evolution of cybersecurity, um, you know, 
basically we start off with you know, browser-based or internet-based attacks, right? So we we'll go back in late 90s, um, you know, we had HTTP, HTTPS. So you start generating attacks on that. We had a lot of attacks where there were email attacks that they exploited the SMTP environment. Um, so you had a lot of email tools that can protect against you know, bad emails coming to you, uh, spam, of course. Um, then you had attacks on SQL. So a lot of people started putting, you know, their a lot of critical data on the database servers, et cetera, and what protocol they use, which is SQL. So then the attack started on, on SQL vectors. So essentially, if you look at how security has evolved through the ages, every time there's a new product set or there's a new product vector or protocol vector, um, it takes a couple of years for that you know, protocol to be widely deployed, right? So today there's about maybe 20% of the networks are in SIP or, or more, of course, the mini enterprises have more. Um, and some of the um, VoIP carriers have, of course, 100% in SIP. So as that you know, implementation of SIP increases, um, when you start hitting the 20% threshold is when attacks start generating more and more because you open yourself up to the broader hacker community, as per se, or the internet. And so that rapidly increases. So that's what we've seen. We've seen about a 10,000% increase in attacks since you know, we first started in the carrier networks in 2012. Um, so that's, you know, very rapid. And every year we're seeing three times, four times, five times pro fold of new attacks and new attack vectors. Um, and just because it's wide, more widely deployed, you get more attacks. And so that's just the way you know, these hackers work. They always look for new targets and new ways to enumerate and make money out of those attacks. Yeah, monetizing definitely is a big thing. So changing topics, this question asks about, Session border control vendors and SPC vendors, and they, they supposedly offer some security safeguards. How does Unified uh, Communication Threat Management boost uh, those capabilities? Right. So basically, um, as I mentioned, so um, if you sort of look at an SPC, um, an SPC is doing a lot of things. They're doing you know, some security, they're doing natural trouble, so they're in registrations, they're doing um, many other things that, um, you know, sort of like a Swiss Army knife, right? Um, and as these networks become more and more um, prevalent, you know, where SIP becomes, you're talking about you know, 20 million users, 100 million users, or 5 million users in SIP, um, or you know, 200 million users in SIP, the threat vector grows tremendously because you have all these endpoints that are now you know, talking to your network, core network, right? And so security um, has to be bifurcated because the traffic patterns increase, so number of registrations in SBC. So SBC's real function is to do that, you know, border function functionality, right? So which is really around net traversal, registrations, et cetera, et cetera. Once they start going to security, if they can't do too much DPI or DPAC inspection on the packets, because that'll slow down the ability to handle calls, right? So that's the thing. It's, it's the classic problem is, you know, do I, if you have a database server that you buy from Dell, why doesn't Dell implement security in their own database servers, right? As, as anyone would, you actually have an external database firewall, like in Perver and others to protect it because you don't want to, um, you know, you want the server, the database server to actually focus on, you know, allowing that database functionality, right? You don't want it to do, you, know, you may want to do a little security like encryption and other things, but you authentication, but you don't want to do the DPI piece, which is really cost and performance requirements are very heavy on it. So the SBC again is, you have so many things going on in the SBC, you load it up with DPI, you suddenly not, can't handle calls, which is really the purpose of the SBC, right? So that's why um, you know, we recommend, and this is sort of traditional sort of migration of any technologies. As you get more and more functions, you have to sort of bifurcate them. So we recommend the bifurcation to still have your security functions, which are layer three, layer four security. The SBC has great security functions, but we're now capturing that piece that's missing. So we talk about 40,000 attacks. The SBC does about 1,000, 2,000 of those attacks, so which is a layer three, layer four. And you have these other threats, threats of attack data about user analysis and all that. The SBC can do, but if they do it, then they are not being able to, they won't have enough horsepower to be able to do just the call process they need to do in, in, uh, on a normal network, right? So that's why um, it's, we complement the SBC. It's, you still need your SBC, and it's, you know, it's fantastic for what it does. Um, but you, it's, the goal is to complement it. And then because the new threats are you know, at the user layer, at the application layer, and then manipulation of these cross-layer attacks from the network application user layer. So that's really interesting, which the SPCs can't do because they're not that, they don't do so much DPI. So it's basically the threat vector grew many, many SIP endpoints that mitigates different attack vectors. So you need a richer environment to block against these attacks. So we completely 
complement an SBC. And all our customers have, you know, Oracle, Ericsson, Huawei, um, Sensei, uh, Sonus, um, Ribbon, I should say, and uh, MetaSwitch, all these SBCs. So we complement all those SBCs. It's true. Most like a lot of security elements, it's defense and depth issue, right? So there's a very synergistic element of what you're doing with SBCs. Right, exactly, exactly. And that's completely right. Mm -hmm. It's the defense and depth, which is really the mantra here. Okay, last question I have for you is around managed services. Uh, in parallel to managed service offerings, can carriers deliver or use unified communication threat management for managed service offerings or to offer a SIP SOC? Yeah, exactly. So that was um, one, that was you know, one I wanted to touch about, and I didn't in this one because we talked a little bit about security and the cost network. But yeah, you can actually monetize this. So you can actually monetize this functionality as you sell it to your enterprise customers. So essentially, you're selling a SIP trunk to enterprise customers. Now, hey, why won't, can't you sell a SIP security offering on top of that SIP trunk with fraud detection and analytics on top of that? So then you can, you know, you're charging the customer maybe a thousand dollars per node for a SIP trunk, just as an example. Um, you can increase that by twenty to thirty percent and have them charge them thirteen hundred dollars or twelve hundred dollars a month and across the board. So it's suddenly you grew your revenue by twenty percent, right? And on your network side, you can offer managed services off. Um, the UCTMs, whether it be hosted or whether it be as a CP device on the network, on the, their network, right? So you can have multiple models. Um, you can offer it um, and do reports. You can offer it sending, um, you know, helping them with troubleshooting issues and a lot of other, other things on, on threat analysis, et cetera. So there is a whole managed service presentation. And the next webinar, I think we'll do on that one. Um, and we can talk about how carriers can actually monetize the UCTM to technology to really build revenue. Um, and this becomes very sticky because if you bring these carriers in and if it's just a step trunk, they can run away to other carriers very rapidly when they get upset or the price goes down. But if you actually have these sticky um, functions, which is security, especially to banks and especially to you know, environments, hospitals or financial institutions um, or government that really security is a big issue, they'll just click, you know, they just check the box without even thinking about it because it's, they need security. It's, they can't live without security. So yeah, it's somewhere you can quickly monetize and then you can add, add quickly 20, 30%, even 40% revenue, just depending on how sophisticated you want to get in, in, and what kind of customer you're working with. Awesome. Well, on top of that, uh, concludes our questions for today. We've got a couple different uh, specific customer questions, which we'll answer offline uh, to people. So if you've asked those, if you've asked those on the chat, we'll definitely get back to you specifically one-to-one um, -one offline. But uh, unless you had any other points, I'll close out today's session. Great. Thank you so much for everyone um, for your time. Again, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is Amitava at redshiftnetworks.com. It's not a very common name, so it's A-M-I-T-A-V-A. -A -A. Please feel free to, feel free to reach out to me, and then we would definitely love to work with you and talk to you and, and help you secure your network. Thank you so much. No, thanks, Amitava. And we'll also make this available on demand. We'll put it up on the Redshift website, and everybody that's registered for today's session will get an email with a link to the archive of today's session. And we'll also send you an invite for upcoming webinars as we post them on a monthly basis. So that concludes today's session. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. And Amitava, thanks for joining us. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate you hosting it. You're welcome. Bye-bye right. now. Bye-bye. Thank you.